I'm going to read it in context. And our topic is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And this is our second sermon. We were looking at Jesus Christ as the way last week. We'll finish that up and look at the truth and the life, Lord willing, today. I'll start at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare your place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, and where I am, that ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Last week we were looking at the way. We noted because of what Jesus did on Calvary <clears throat> almost 2,000 years ago, if you believe in Christ, your sins have been forgiven. They've been blotted out. They've been washed away by the precious blood of Christ. They've been forgiven and forgotten by God. The cross of Christ is hard for people to accept because they think they need to do something to appease God or earn God's favor. And thus all the world's religions are basically based on works. You've got to do something to be saved. You have to do good works. Say you're sorry, do good works, turn over a new leaf, or do meditative techniques, but that's not the way of Christianity. The Bible is clear that only what Jesus accomplished is acceptable to God. <clears throat> Therefore, we must count all of our supposed good works, our achievements, our strivings as worthless trash before God and depend solely on Jesus Christ for salvation. <clears throat> now Christ is the way, not simply because he removed the curse of sin for believers, Galatians 3.13, but also because he obeyed the law in exhaustive detail thus earning eternal life for his people. This is something evangelicalism tends to ignore. If a person wants eternal life, the penalty of sin has to be paid for. <clears throat> it must be removed. And a perfect obedience to the moral law must be rendered. A perfect, positive righteousness. Now, a Christian will be sanctified by Christ's Spirit, and will lead a holy life, but even the best of Christians sin. Even the best believers sin every single day, in fact. Every day. That's why we pray every day for forgiveness, the Lord's Prayer. The righteousness that God requires for entrance into heaven is a perfect, positive, perpetual righteousness. Every second of every day. Every moment. Every hour. For your whole life. From the time you're born till the time you die. That's what God requires. Perfect righteousness. Perfect obedience to the law. <clears throat> well, the righteousness that God requires into heaven is something obviously we cannot fulfill. So Jesus came to fulfill all righteousness. Matthew 3.15 His whole life of obedience was vicarious so he could provide the perfect righteousness that we need to stand before the Father on the day of judgment. Therefore, this is what Paul says, Romans 5, 18 to 19. Therefore, as the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, <clears throat> even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men and the justification of life. You can't provide the righteousness you need. No matter how good you may think you are, you just can't do it. You're not good enough. You're not good enough to meet God's perfect standard. So we need the righteousness of Christ. That's what we need. The Savior was born under the law in order to redeem those who were under the law. Galatians 4, 5 to 6. Consequently, he became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. He provides the righteousness that you cannot provide. Jesus, by his death on the cross, removes our filthy garments, representing our sin, our guilt. 
and in their place he clothes us with the white spotless garments of his righteousness. And you can read about uh, this in a, a beautiful form in Zechariah 3, 3 to 4. <coughs> he provides the white glistening wedding clothes, wedding clothes that allow us to enter the wedding banquet of the Lamb. When the Bible speaks of the totality of Christ's redemptive work, what theologians refer to as Christ's active and passive obedience, his life and his death on the cross, <clears throat> it calls it the righteousness of Christ. Romans 10, 4. The righteousness of God, Romans 1, 17. 3, 5, 21 and 22, 10, 3. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Philippians 3, 9. The righteousness of one, Romans 5, 18. The righteousness of faith, Romans 4, 11 and 13 and 9, 10 and 10, 6. It is the righteousness that God imputes apart from works, Romans 4, 6. With this rich doctrine in mind, we can, can only conclude that Jesus is the only way to heaven because the Father can only declare us righteous on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Okay? God can only declare us righteous on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Christ died for the ungodly. The Bible refers to us as ungodly. The Bible refers to us as sinners. The Bible says that even our best works are tainted with sin. We cannot merit eternal life. Romans 3, 21 to 24. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. <clears throat> For there is no difference. He's telling us why this righteousness is necessary. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And also Galatians 2.16, Paul says, A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Even your best works are tainted with sin. Sinners must look to Jesus through faith, they must look to Jesus Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. They must look to Jesus Christ's resurrection. They must look to Jesus Christ's perfect righteousness. Another reason that Jesus is the only way to heaven is that all believers <coughs> partake of the victory and benefits of the resurrection. The efficacy of our Lord's death cannot be separated from his resurrection. The resurrection not only proves that God has accepted the sacrifice of Christ, but it also plays a crucial role in salvation itself. Romans 5.10 For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. <coughs> the Savior's resurrection tells us that he conquered death and he merited life in the fullest sense of the term. Revelation 1.18, John 11.25, 1 Corinthians 15.21-22. It also, of course, proves that he defeated and subdued the devil. Hebrews 2.14. It is important for us to recognize <clears throat> that the victorious, living, exalted Redeemer mediates for his people, and he applies his redemptive work to individuals throughout history. Now, when he said it is finished, the foundation of redemption has been done. It's complete. That one perfect sacrifice is complete. But once he ascends to the Father, the application of redemption continues. And Christ is actively mediating for his people, actively interceding, actively applying redemption in history. So our faith is to be directed to a victorious living Savior <clears throat> who conquered Satan, sin, and death. And note the importance of our Lord's resurrection. Of course, we're going to look at the resurrection more later as we talk about Jesus as the life. Uh, the importance of our Lord's resurrection, Paul's words, 
Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'll stop for a moment and reflect on Jesus' words. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? If you think he is only one way among many, okay, that's what's taught today in the school, that's what's taught by people, he's only one among many ways, that all religions, if sincerely held, will lead to God, that all paths diligently follow and end up in heaven, then you do not really understand Christ at all. And the importance of the cross, the absolute necessity of his death on the cross. You don't understand who Christ really is or the importance or uniqueness of what he accomplished. You tragically do not yet understand the wickedness of sin. The holiness of God in the dire predicament that you're in because of sin. Jesus is the only way to God because he is the only way to have sin and guilt removed. And he is the only way to have that imputed righteousness that merits eternal life. Now, your life is full of sin. Your best works are tainted with sin. Your record is wicked and vile compared especially to God's perfect righteousness and holiness. So your only hope is to recognize this fact, confess your sin and guilt to God, and then look to Christ in his righteousness. That's your only hope. That's your only hope. Lay down the weapons of your warfare. Look to Christ dying and bleeding on the cross. Look to him rising from the dead. Look to him seated at the right hand of God the Father. Look to his resurrection. Look to his cross. Look to his righteousness. That's your only hope. For there is nothing in and of yourself that you can have to offer to God that will please him at all. That can merit eternal life. Listen to what Jesus says and bow the knee to him as Lord and Savior. <clears throat> this is from John 6, 37 to 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. <clears throat> and this... <clears throat> This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. You're going to possess eternal life in the present if you believe in Christ. And you have Christ's own promise, his own guarantee that he personally will rise you from the dead on that day, raise you from the dead on the final day with a new glorified body to live with him forever in heaven. Well, let's look at our second major point, which Jesus is as the truth. Jesus as the truth. <clears throat> the second of Christ's amazing self-descriptions is that he is the truth, not a truth, the truth. The statement means much more than the reality <clears throat> that our Lord was a teacher of the truth or a great prophet who told people truths about the Father. He is the divine word. The source of all truth is in his person. The root of all knowledge and meaning is found only in him. When Jesus says, I am the truth, it refers to his essential being, <clears throat> from which the truth of words necessarily flows. It also refers to his incarnate state, for he came unto mankind to reveal the Father. If you see Jesus Christ, he said to his apostles, you've seen the Father. Following our text, the Lord says, if you had had known me, you would have known my Father also. <clears throat> and from now on, you shall know him and have seen him. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Verses 7 and 9. Christ is the full and final revelation of God. And thus to know anything correctly as to its true meaning and purpose, one must first study Jesus and have faith in him. You want truth? You want meaning? You want to understand reality? You've got to go to Christ. Paul makes this point when he says that in him, Colossians 2, 3, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Once you have theology, reasoning, factuality, philosophy, and living, 
must start with the Christ of Scripture. Since Christ is God manifest, all real wisdom originates in him. Since Jesus is the source of redemption, all spiritual enlightenment and knowledge comes from him. The Savior in his person and work is the key to the storehouse of all of God's resources. He's the key. He's the door. Consequently, <clears throat> we are not to seek knowledge or meaning or ethics autonomously that is on our own without the Bible, without Christ. To do so is foolishness and rebellion. The devil told Eve in the garden that true wisdom, true knowledge, only comes by ignoring God and his word. Eve, no, don't listen to what God says. He's lying to you. Check out the tree. Look at it. Study it. Use empiricism. Use your reason. Use it autonomously. That's how you arrive at truth. He lied to Eve and led into the fall. <clears throat> the result of following Satan's advice was sin, darkness, ignorance, and foolishness. The wisdom of this world seems scholarly, but is really dishonest, proud, and wicked. Listen to the way Paul describes unbelievers in Ephesians 4. This is verses 17 and 18. As people who walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, <coughs> because of the blindness in their heart. That's a person apart from Christ. What a terrible state to be in. Living a lie, believing a lie. Your whole life is based on a lie. Terror. Solomon says, Proverbs 4, 19, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. They don't know. Paul says that man, men create false religions and philosophies in order to avoid the truth about God revealed to them in the natural order. Romans 1, 18 and following. <clears throat> Thus we see that genuine knowledge is connected to true spirituality and biblical ethics, all of which are found in Christ. God made man upright with true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. But as a result of the fall, they have sought out many schemes or many devices, Ecclesiastes 7.29. As a result, Romans 3.11, there is none who understands. Romans 1.22, professing to be wise, they became fools. First Corinthians 3, 19 to 20, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Do you want your whole life to be futile? Do you want your whole life to be completely vanity? Do you want your whole life to be a complete waste? Well, I hope not. Trust in Christ. Believe in Christ. Look to him. Submit your life to the word of God, and your life will have meaning. Jesus' infinite knowledge and through his work of redemption renews our minds, Ephesians 4.23, <clears throat> and restores us to true righteousness and holiness, Ephesians 4.24. Through his person and work, he grants us repentance, 2 Timothy 2.25, under the knowledge of the truth. If you know the truth, it's because Christ had mercy on you. He bestowed the Holy Spirit upon your heart. He regenerated your heart. He opened your blind eyes. He gave you, took out your heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh. And he revealed unto you the truth. <clears throat> As a result, we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. As truth itself restores men to the truth by his redemptive work, Christ sets us free from human tradition, worldly philosophies, and the worldviews of darkness. He sets us free from all that garbage, all those lies of the devil. Churches apostatize when they turn away from Christ and they embrace the world's way of thinking. Your only safety is to have refuge in Christ. Your only safety is to look to him alone. Your only safety is to trust in Christ alone. Don't trust the world. Thus Paul warned us, Colossians 2, 9 to 10, beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Why? Well, he tells us. For in him 
dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. You want wisdom? You want truth? You want to understand reality? You want meaning in your life? You want to know why we're here? You want to know what we need to be doing? Look to Christ. The unregenerate man can only know truth in a superficial, disconnected, surface sense. He can know that a tree exists, that it derives nourishment from the sun and the soil, that it is good for making houses and furniture. He can know that. He may even make beautiful furniture. But he cannot tell us anything about where the tree came from or why they exist. He can't. When he looks at a plant, an animal, or even uh, a man, what does he see? <clears throat> he sees something that evolved, according to his worldview, from pond scum. He sees a completely meaningless, random, chance universe. In his attempt to suppress the truth about God, the modern unbeliever asserts that everything evolved from chaos. And what is the miracle for the unbeliever? The miracle is time. Take some dirt, take some water, take some sunlight, take billions and billions and billions of years, and you have life. They, agree, they believe in irrational miracles. He believes that we live in an impersonal chance universe where ethical absolutes, real meaning, and even universal laws of logic have no place. <clears throat> he believes that man is the pinnacle of this random process, can impose meaning and ethics upon his environment. That's man as God. But such thinking is arbitrary and inconsistent. If we evolve from pond scum, if everything's by chance, if everything is nothing but atoms randomly floating in the void, if everything is pure contingency, everything is from chance, you can't make order out of that. You can pretend, but you can't have true meaning or order. Modern, naturalistic, secular, humanistic thought, uh, thought leads men with only two cho choices regarding existence. They can steal concepts of meaning and ethics from the Christian worldview and simply ignore that great inconsistency. That's what most people do. They talk all about love and ethics and peace and getting along and community and all these wonderful things. But they have no basis for that. They have no philosophical basis. They have no epistemological basis. They have no basis whatsoever. It all is stolen from the Christian worldview. Unbelievers almost always do this because they like to talk about love and justice, hope and meaning. Life is pretty rough when you don't think about those kind of things and if your life has no purpose. So they make up their purpose. They steal from the Christian worldview. Or they can be consistent and adopt the form of nihilism. Now, nihilism is the bold acceptance of the idea that any real knowledge, meaning, and ethics is impossible. And the existentialists would talk this way. It's just simply impossible. Life doesn't have any meaning. You have no more meaning than a maggot. You have no more meaning uh, to your life than a fruit fly. And a lot of people believe that. Such a position leads to either anarchy or statism, as men impose their arbitrary will on others by force. Nietzsche, the Superman, the will to power, flows from this kind of thinking and, of course, the Nazis of Germany. <clears throat> J.G. Voss notes that the great moral decline in the West and the chaos and violence that flowed from, flowed from this decline is directly <clears throat> attributable, attributable to a rejection of the Christian worldview. Listen to what he says. It is entirely true that World War II was, in the deepest sense, a result of widespread acceptance of the doctrine of human evolution as the truth accompanied by a gradual but very real rejection of the Bible by highly educated people as their standard of faith and life. The logic involved in this moral decline is really unavoidable. <clears throat> when once the assumption of the truth of human evolution has been made, if we were not created by God, then we are not responsible to God for our beliefs and actions. If we are not responsible to God for our beliefs and actions, then we are responsible only to our fellow man and to ourselves. In that case, there is no absolute, permanent moral standard. What is right and wrong changes with the times and the circumstances. 
from this position is but a step, and I would say a small step, to the ideology of Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. The apparently innocent th theory of evolution has wrought tremendous havoc in human life. We should always realize that evolution is not merely a biological theory, it is also a philosophy of life held by many, end of quote. <clears throat> it leads to the gas chamber, it leads to Auschwitz, it leads to the death camp, it leads to uh, the gulag in Russia. Because life has no meaning. Therefore, power flows from the barrel of a gun. Now, ultimately, you must either place your faith in Christ, who is truth itself, or you must embrace a lie. That's your choice. To know Jesus is to know the infinite personal God who created all things. To trust in the Savior is to embrace truth and meaning in the fullest sense. <clears throat> People reject Christ because they're unwilling to face the truth about their own sin and inability. And it is our hope and our prayer that you will humble yourself, acknowledge your sin, and look to Christ who reveals the Father. <clears throat> you want truth? You want meaning? You want purpose in your life? You've got to go to the foot of the cross. You've got to look to Christ, dying and bleeding for sinners. You have to look to Jesus Christ, the living Savior who has ascended unto God. That's the only way that you will have truth. Believe in Jesus as the divine human mediator and trust in his works and his, in, in his words. That's your only hope. John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. There is no freedom in human autonomy. There is no freedom in secular humanism. There is no freedom in atheism and uh, atheistic naturalism. There is only anarchy. There is only lawlessness. There is only statism. There is only brutality. And that brings us to our third point, Christ as the life. <clears throat> our Lord's third assertion is that he is the life. Jesus is the source and foundation not only of all physical life, but all spiritual life as well. The person who does not believe in the Savior, who is not born again, is spiritually dead. He lives physically, but he's under God, God's wrath. He exists under the wrath of God, he's blind to the truth, and he's spiritually lifeless. The sentence of eternal death and hell is upon him. And he cannot escape death and hell unless he believes in Jesus Christ. But whoever believes in Jesus possesses life, eternal life, right now. The moment he believes. He has passed from death unto life. And he will have eternal life even when his physical body dies. Because immediately his soul goes to be with Christ in heaven. For the unbeliever, physical death is the entrance to hell. Physical death is part of God's wrath against sin. For the believer, physical death, is, it is a sting, but it is not God's wrath and judgment upon the believer because he goes to be with Christ in heaven immediately and live forevermore with him. <clears throat> he will have glorified life <clears throat> after the resurrection when he goes into the eternal state, when his resurrected body is glorified by Jesus Christ at the second coming, 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 56. <clears throat> when we speak of Jesus Christ as the life, we speak of his person and his work. The Bible says that he's the author, the captain, the pioneer of salvation in the most comprehensive sense of the term. There is a vital union that exists between all genuine believers in Christ during his life, death, and resurrection. <clears throat> when he conquered sin and death at the cross, his victory was our victory. When he rose from the dead, from the grave, we rose with him. 
The Savior is the trunk and we are the branches, John 15, 5. He's the fountain of living water, John 4, 10. The resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. 25. The bread of life, John 6, 51. And the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, Colossians 1, 18. In him, and him alone, we derive spiritual life and nourishment. His resurrection is the reason that believers have and live in newness of life. Regeneration, the new birth, is the result of union with Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. Scripture emphasizes that, this crucial truth in a number of passages. John eleven twenty five. 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. <coughs> if you're a Christian, you don't have to worry about death. You have a guarantee from Christ's lips. You will rise unto life with a new glorified body. Jesus does not simply say that he will give resurrection and life, but that he himself is the resurrection and the life. He is the source of eternal life. The moment that you place your trust in Christ, you possess the life of the age to come. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 20. For since by man came death, and that's Adam. By man came death. By man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Those in Adam die. Those in Christ shall live. He's the source of life. Jesus said, <clears throat> Revelation 1.18, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. <clears throat> exit in, exit out. You want to escape death? You got to go to Christ. You want to escape hell? You got to go to Christ. You want to escape God's wrath? You got to go to Christ. He is the source of life. When the Bible speaks <clears throat> of Christ as a life, it directs us especially to the benefits of his resurrection. Here's, here's some of the benefits. <clears throat> the first benefit, we've mentioned this. The first benefit that the elect receive from his resurrection is regeneration. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love of which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. <coughs> John 3, 3. In Christ we are born again. Well, here's uh, Colossians 2, 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a lot... He has made a life together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. In Christ we are born again, John 3.3, 3, regenerated, Titus 3.5, made alive, Ephesians 2.5. We are called a new creation. Galatians 6.15, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Behold, all things are gone. They're behind you now. You're a new creation in Christ. We're a new man, Ephesians 4.24. Why are some people born again while others are not? Why is it that some are regenerated and some remain spiritually dead? The difference is that some are united with Jesus Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. Here's what Hodge says. It is in virtue of their union with Christ that believers are partakers of his life and exaltation. They are to reign with him. The blessings then of which the apostle speaks are represented as already conferred for two reasons. First, because they are in a measure already enjoyed, and secondly, because the continuance and communion of these blessings are rendered certain by the nature of the union between Christ and his people. In him, they are already raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God. <coughs> That's amazing. And the Apostle John also teaches that believers are regenerated as a consequence of their union with Christ in his resurrection. The Apostle speaks of a first resurrection that 
occurs long before the final resurrection at the end of human history. Here's actually, these are the words of Jesus Christ himself, John 5, 24 to 25. Over such, the second death has no power. Excuse me, this is Revelation 20, verse 6. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be kings and priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The first resurrection refers to the resurrection of Christ in which all believers partake. Consequently, they cannot be harmed by the second death. <clears throat> the second death has no power. In John's Gospel, Jesus spoke of two resurrections. The first resurrection refers to regeneration and salvation. John 5, 24 to 25. It occurs when a person hears the word of God. Jesus speaks life to the dead soul. And the person believes in Christ. The second resurrection refers to the bodily, physical resurrection that occurs at the second coming of Christ. Those who are particular spiritual resurrection, the first resurrection, are raised to life. They're given spiritual life. And those who do not partake of the first resurrection are raised to condemnation. They're cast in the lake of fire. Believers are raised to live with God. Paul says that our Lord became a life-giving spirit at the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. At his resurrection, Christ received a supernatural, spiritual glorified body. Thus, the resurrected Messiah, the second or last Adam, is the representative man, the firstborn from the dead, Colossians 1.18, the pioneer or lead climber for the elect and redemptive life. And he himself, is the source for the new life, both the new life of regeneration and the new life at the resurrection from the dead, the bodily resurrection, <clears throat> where all believers receive spiritual glorified bodies. Here's what Matthew Poole says. The last Adam, by which he meaneth Christ, who in time was after the first Adam, was born in the last days, <coughs> and was last common head, as Adam was the first, with respect of grace and spiritual regeneration. He was made a quickening spirit. He was made so, not when he was conceived and born, for he had a body subject to the same natural infirmities that ours are, but upon his resurrection from the dead, when though he had the same body in respect of the substance of it, he had a different qualities and was much more spiritual, with which body he ascended up into the spiritual life and also to quicken our mortal bodies at his second coming when he shall raise the dead out of their graves a resurrection of life, thanks to Christ. As the rays of the light of the sun give light, warmth and life to plants in the spring, the resurrected Savior imparts spiritual life to his own people. John 5, 26, where the Father has life in himself, so he is granted to the Son to have life in himself. Galatians 6, 15, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Do you believe in Christ? Have you been regenerated by the Spirit? Have you been born again? Are you trusting in Christ? If you do, you have new life. Well, the second fruit of Jesus' resurrection is justification. Romans 4, 24 to 25. <clears throat> it, and he's talking about the righteousness of Christ, shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus... <coughs> Excuse me who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Now, although the New Testament virtually always <coughs> relates justification directly to Christ's death, blood, suffering, or atonement, Paul relates it here to the resurrection for good reason. Because the justification of sinners that occurred at the cross was perfected, proved, and made efficacious at the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Here's what uh, theologian commentator John Murray says, and it's excellent. He gives us five reasons why the apostle connects the resurrection of Christ with the justification of sinners. Number one, quote, number one, we are justified by faith, but this faith must be directed to Jesus. 322 and 26. 
but only as the living Lord can he be the object of faith. Number two, it is in union with Christ that we are justified. Do you think 1 Corinthians 5, 21? Only as active through the resurrection can any virtue proceed from Christ to us, and only with the living Christ can union have efficacy. Number three, the righteousness of Christ by which we are justified, 5, 17, 18, and 19, has its embodiment in Christ. It can never be thought of as an abstraction from him as a reservoir of merit stored up. Only as the living one can Christ be the embodiment of righteousness and be made to us righteousness from God. 1 Corinthians 1.30. <clears throat> By the way, this is his commentary on the book of Romans. Number four. The death and resurrection of Christ are inseparable. Hence, even the blood of Christ, as related to our justification, uh, Romans 3.24, 25, 5, 9, 8, 33, and 34, could have no efficacy to that end in isolation from the resurrection. Number five, it is through the mediation of Christ that we come to stand in the grace of justification, 5-2. But the mediation of Christ could not be operative if, it will, if he were still under the power of death. End of quote. It's a great statement. We believe in a living Christ, and we are living in union with a living Christ, and we have the spirit of Christ within us. Christ is the living Savior, who has been raised from the dead. Now, given the importance of the resurrection and its integral role in a believer's justification, we should not be surprised to note Paul, he has an obsession with the resurrection. Listen to what he says, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I set all these things aside. I set my good works aside as filthy rubbish. The best things I've done, I consider to be garbage that I may know Christ in the power of his resurrection. And then the third fruit of Christ's resurrection is sanctification. <clears throat> now the most detailed discussion of sanctification in the New Testament is found in Romans 6, 1 to 7, 6. In this section of scripture, Paul goes through a very lengthy discussion uh, where he just talks about the foundation for personal godliness in the Christian life. The apostle teaches that all the imperatives related to the Christian life, the believer's progressive sanctification, <clears throat> are grounded upon a definitive sanctification achieved by Jesus Christ himself. By virtue of a believer's intimate union with our Lord and his death and resurrection, Christians have been delivered from the power of sin. Now, they're not sinless, but we've been delivered from the power of sin. It's not our habitual state. It's not our existence. We don't swim in it. We still have to deal with it because our natures have not come, sin has not been eradicated, but we've been delivered from the power of it. Paul writes, and this is uh, 6, 4 to 5, and 8 to 10. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. <coughs> for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So Jesus' death is the reason that Christians have died to the enslaving, reigning, defiling power of sin. His resurrection is the reason that believers have and live in newness of life. The Prince of Life, Acts 3.15, was and is the first and only fully sanctified man. That's Christ. And he imparts his, this sanctification to others first in regeneration, or as the Puritans called it, initial sanctification, and then progressively through the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Here's the confession of faith says. 15.1. They were effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified really and personally through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection. The ethical imperatives in the epistles arise out of and are rooted in the gracious indicatives that is Jesus' past redemptive acts in history. <clears throat> Paul 
If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. This is Colossians 3, 1 to 5 and 5. 3, 1 to 5. Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you die, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Therefore, put to death the de your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. <coughs> Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 John 3, 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Okay, he does not habitually live in sin. For a seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 to 17. For he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When the apostle says we no longer live after the flesh, he's simply pointing out to the historical fact that our Lord has been resurrected and glorified and thus lives in a new, exalted, victorious state. That therefore proceeds from this historical reality. When Paul says that for the, those in Christ, all things have passed away, the verb tense, eris, points to a moment of time when the Holy Spirit regenerated them. But then the apostle says, all things have become new. He changes the verb tense, this time using the perfect indicating that all things became and continue to become new. What happened in regeneration will radiate through your whole life as you live for Christ, to serve him. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, Christians are regenerated and progressively sanctified. As there was a radical discontinuity between the state of humiliation, Christ according to the flesh, there was a radical discontinuity from the state of being unregenerate, spiritually dead, and being born again, alive in Christ. The old mode of thinking and living, the world and life view, the passions, the lust, affections, and the actions have been definitively slain with Christ. That doesn't mean you're going to be sinless. You're going to fall. You're going to sin sometimes. But that old life has been slain. And in regeneration, it is replaced with a whole new way of thinking and living. <coughs> Since we have been raised with Christ, we must continue to walk consistently with that new and continuous life. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, you're saved unto good works. And then the fourth fruit of the Lord's resurrection, his life is glorification. After writing that we, the apostles, have seen, looked upon, and handled the word of life, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, John says, 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Paul says that Christ himself will transform our bodies into glorified bodies. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Christ does that. The foundation of this transformation is the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, but now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, <coughs> those who are his at his coming. Every Christian who ever lived, every true believer in the Messiah to come in the Old Testament and Christ in the New Testament, every true believer throughout history will be raised and given a new glorified body by Jesus Christ when he returns. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, 43, 
47 to 53. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. As we have borne the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. <clears throat> For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The salvation that our Lord achieved affects the whole man, body, and soul. Yes, your body will be redeemed. It'll come out of the tomb from a state of putrefaction, from dust to glory, from dust to glory. When Jesus rose in the glorious immortal spiritual body, he established the redemptive foundation and thus guaranteed every, every believer's regeneration as well as their future resurrection in a similar glorified body. <clears throat> All believers should hope and look to and long for that day when we receive new glorified bodies. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5, For we know that our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are on this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So although all true believers share in Christ's glorified life, in this life, <clears throat> regeneration, justification, sanctification, the full realization of our new life must await the second coming of Christ when our salvation is brought to completion, when we get that new glorified body. Jesus is the life. If you want to have the resurrection unto life, you have to believe in him. <clears throat> Now, the fifth root of five Christ's resurrection is the restoration of the whole created order. As the fall of the first Adam resulted in a curse upon creation and a derailment of the God-glorifying nature of the dominion mandate, the redemption of Christ is directed to the salvation of the elect, the reinstitution and enabling of the original dominion mandate, and the salvation of the whole created order. <coughs> the earth as it now is, with its disease, with its tornadoes that kill people, with its earthquakes and tsunamis that kill people, with its uh, uh, hurricanes and tidal waves and all these things. Drought, flooding, that'll all be gone. The earth will be redeemed. The effects of the fall upon the earth will be no more. The Son of God through his redemptive work makes sure that God's original purpose for mankind and the creation is not lost. <clears throat> To save a multitude and then leave them forever in a fallen, corrupt world would be a contradiction of God's original purpose for mankind. Thus, the scope of Christ's mission is cosmic. He not only makes his people a new creation by his resurrection power, but he makes a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 2 Peter 3.13 Jesus spoke of a coming restoration of the world in Matthew 19.28. Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits in the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now that word translated regeneration, or some translations have new world, or renewal of all things, is palingentia. It occurs only one other time in the New Testament, in Titus 3.5, in reference to the Christian's new birth. It literally means regeneration, rebirth, recreation. And this passage can be interpreted in two ways, both of which support the idea that in Jesus' resurrection there is a restoration of the whole created order. The first interpretation takes the word regeneration in a definitive sense. That in the regeneration of the world, in principle, uh, it's an, in principle an accomplished fact in the Savior's resurrection and ascension to the throne of glory. In principle, the world's been reborn already. 
The judging of the 12 tribes on the apostles would then refer to the preaching of the gospel and the establishment of church discipline throughout Israel after the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 and following. The second view, which is held by the great majority of commentators, is that it refers to the final day, the day of judgment. When Christ returns, the saints will receive their glorified bodies and there will be a glorious restitution of all things. It'll be a cosmic rest, a regeneration, a cosmic new genesis, a new creation. No more disease, no more mosquito bites, no more bee stings, no more snake bites, no more calamity, no more death, no more suffering, no more anything that is negative, no more anything that is a result of sin. It'll all be gone because Jesus Christ is the life. And that life will spread throughout the whole earth until the whole earth itself is redeemed. <clears throat> the concept of restoration or recreation is common in the New Testament. Peter spoke of the restoration of all things, Acts 3.21. <clears throat> the Apostle John tells of a recreation as the climax of all human history in the book of Revelation. 21.1-4, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The former things have passed. While describing a new paradise, the apocalypse clearly points back to the original pre-fall Eden. In the new world, there is no more death. There is no more tears. There is no more suffering. There is no more pain. There is a pure river of water of life that flows from God and the Lamb's throne, 22.1. And the tree of life is found in abundance, 22.2. And there is no more curse, 22.3. Or night, 22.5. All those who have not been cleansed by Jesus Christ who continue to sin and commit immor immorality are cast into the lake of fire and they are excluded from this new creation. 22.15 If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're not going to get to participate in this glorious new creation where the earth is remade into paradise. Now, before the fall, before the flood, you know, there was uh, tropical palm trees growing in Greenland and in Alaska. The earth was a paradise, like Hawaii. But no more biting insects, no more disease. And best of all, there is a continuous light, 22.5. <clears throat> the salvation that our Lord achieved gives the church and the creation even greater blessings than the original Eden. Christ's life is comprehensive. And Paul also discusses a comprehensive cosmic reconciliation. Listen to this. Colossians 1, 18 to 20. And he is the head of the body, <clears throat> the church who is the firstborn, the, uh, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. So Jesus is the mediator, not simply of the original creation, but of the mediator of the, and the firstborn of the second creation. Listen to what Paul says when he talks about uh, this recreation. Uh, Romans 8, 18 to 23. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to, to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So, the power of Christ's resurrection, that life, he is the life, will overturn the frustration, the emptiness, the futility of the present world order. The creation which presently subject to decay, to corruption, to the evils of disease, death, and uh, predation and pain will be freed by our Lord's liberation from the tomb. <clears throat> no more tears. No more fear. No more pain. No more death. No more sorrow. No more disease. That's coming. All because Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. Are you trusting in that? Perfect redemption. After the threefold exclamation of Christ, our Lord, 
repeats a statement in a different way for emphasis. Verse 6, no one comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> Jesus wants to make sure that we do not misunderstand or water down what he has just taught. Jesus wants to make sure that we have a full understanding. Not one person will be saved and enter heaven to be with God unless they believe in Christ and are redeemed by him. In other words, sin can only be removed by Jesus' blood by a sacrificial death. The only righteousness that God will accept for entrance into life is Christ's perfect righteousness. The only person who ever lived who conquered sin, death, and the grave is the Savior, the divine human mediator. <clears throat> there is nothing hard or difficult about this statement. The gospel is simple. A five-year-old could understand the gospel. The point is, are you going to trust in Christ? Are you going to bow the knee to him? Are you going to believe in him? It is crystal clear. Heaven is only for those who believe in Jesus. Only Bible-believing, real Christians will behold the face of God in paradise. All others are excluded. Everyone else will go to hell for rejecting the Christ of Scripture. If you take away Jesus and the truth, the way, the truth, and the life are gone. The way, the truth, and the life are gone. No way, no truth, no life are left if you take away Jesus. He that believes not shall be damned. All hope of God in heaven outside of Jesus is vanity and works. When Jesus said, except through me, it is absolute, it is final. This is from the, Jesus Christ to you. Are you going to believe? Men are not really dependent upon Christ as the foundation or source of salvation, but also for their knowledge of redemptive truth. Moreover, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the souls of the elect that imparts spiritual life, raises dead hearts to heavenly life, enlightens darkened minds of the truth, and draws the sinner to Christ, flows from the efficacy of Jesus' death and resurrection. <clears throat> Without Christ and his work, his death on the cross, his resurrection, there is no salvation, there is no redemptive truth, there's no spiritual life, there's no light, and there's consequently no way to heaven to live in bliss with God. He's the only way. The claims of Christ <clears throat> are exclusive, absolute, and totally true. I hope you're paying attention. You may be hit by a car tomorrow and you may die. <clears throat> I talked to a person about Christ, an older gentleman, and he laughed and mocked. The next day he died of a massive heart attack. The very next day he had only 12 hours to live and he rejected the gospel. I hope that's not you. These claims of Christ stand as a warning in capital letters to all those who will not see, who do not see the need or importance of embracing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. There's nothing to do but to look to Christ in all his fullness, power, and love. That's all you got to do. Look to him with the eye of faith dying, suffering, bleeding, and dying for your sins. Look to him and trust in his vicarious victorious resurrection, his ascension, his heavenly mediation. What you could never do in a million years, what you could never do in a billion years, he did. He's done it. He achieved a perfect redemption. Scripture presents him fully to your eyes. <coughs> Behold the blessed Redeemer, the only way to God, the only door to heaven, the only mediator between God and man. Look to Christ. Now is the time to repent, to radically change your mind and reject the philosophy of this fallen world system. The universal message today is that all religions are good. All religions lead to God. They talk about the wonderful world religions and they're all so wonderful. We should respect all of them. That's a lie of the devil. Such a view is not only self-contradictory and foolish, but it is the exact opposite of what Jesus himself has just taught. Heaven is not a place for all religions or all mankind, but only for believers in Christ. So what you believe 
is crucial. It can make the difference between living forever in heaven or suffering forever in hell. What you believe is crucial. What you believe is important. Don't ever forget our Lord's precious words. There is no way to God, the Father, but by me. There is no way to God, the Father, but by me, except through me. Christ is your only hope. Look to him, trust in him, bow the knee to him. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ. Indeed, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to you, Lord. We bow the knee to him. We place our faith in him alone, rejecting our own works. The works of the best Christians are filthy rags in your sight. You are so holy and righteous and perfect, they don't even come close to, to meriting anything. We need to cling solely to your dear son and his cross and his empty tomb and what he has accomplished. We thank you for your son. In Jesus' name, amen.